So I'd like I'd like to welcome Kit Luce with Exploring Spatial Reasoning. It's always great to see people from all over Ontario joining us with um, in with professional development um, in the evening, and we're really excited to be learning alongside with Kit. And thank you. And I'll turn it over to you, Kit. Okay. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I see some familiar faces, so that's always nice. Um, and new faces get to know you. Um, I know it's really busy. Um, do a number of you have a PD day tomorrow, a PA tomorrow? Um, do you want to just wave your hand there? Yes, no? Yes? Yeah, okay. So some of you are uh, preparing to write report cards tomorrow, I know. Um, but I'm hoping that tonight you'll get lots of information and uh, if not to use um, right away tomorrow certainly next week so I wanted to share a little bit um, first of all on this first screen you'll see there's a bitly there um, it says bit.ly uh, backslash OTF spatial and that's the link to this Google slide presentation so you are more than welcome to write that down save it, open the slide deck, um, and if you are a Google Drive user, um, you will be able to add that to Drive, make a copy of it, and have it for future reference. Um, I know the PowerPoints are always uploaded to the OTF Connect site, um, along with all the links for the resources, so you can certainly go to OTF and access them there. Um, so you'll have both of those uh, options. The links that are at the end of my slide deck aren't live on the PowerPoint, uh, but they are live on the Google Slides, and as well, they will be posted on the OTF Connects website. So anything that I'm sharing, um, you will have access to for um, furthering your learning. So for those of you I haven't met, I just... Um, I'd like to put a bit of a face to uh, this voice that you're going to be listening to, and I, my voice might get a little raspy as we go on. Um, my name is, is Kit. I'm an instruction and assessment facilitator, um, which this year essentially means I'm a math coach focusing in uh, the junior grades, and in, um, I'm supporting uh, an, in, an intensive support school as part of the RMS, the Renewed Math Strategy, for the Simcoe County District School Board. And you'll see on the slide there my email, uh, as well as uh, my Twitter. And I love to continue the conversation after tonight. If you ever want to email me or if you want to connect on Twitter, um, I'd love to hear from you. So a little few images there. Uh, the top pick there is my family. Um, one of those, uh, I, one of my sons is getting married this summer, so there's a, an extra person there. Um, we have two golden tr retrievers, and I, they're actually outside my bedroom door now trying to get in. Uh, they uh, can't quite figure out why they're locked out. Um, and the third dog there is uh, my son's dog. So we're uh, a close family, uh, we're a busy family. And um, there's lots going on. So it's nice to get to know you. And at least you have a little bit of a picture in your head. So tonight we're going to be talking about what is spatial reasoning, um, why we should care about it in primary, um, get a really good overview of the different spatial reasoning concepts and processes, we're going to explore lots of activities and tasks and lessons that you can bring right to your classroom um, immediately, tomorrow or next week. And as I said before, the last few slides, um, I provided a number of links for those of you who want to further and, and deepen your learning. So I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey in spatial reasoning. So. Um, I always believed I wasn't good at spatial stuff. 
And I didn't like puzzles. Uh, I didn't like backing into uh, parking spots. I had difficulty orienting myself in a new space. So if I went to a new school, um, I didn't immediately grasp the layout of the floor plan, um, where things were. It always took me several trips. Um, when I would uh, want to map out a trip, I would have to turn the map um, and try to figure out if I was turning left or right. Um, I didn't navigate by north or south. And uh, about two years ago, I heard Kathy Bruce present her research at an Ontario Mathematics Coordinators Association. And the image there of that smiling woman is Kathy Bruce. And she's a math educator and researcher. And she presented the research they were doing with um, the Math for Young Children project that eventually led to this resource called Taking Shape. And I was really intrigued then by how important this was for all students, and in particular, for young students. So I would read the Paying Attention to Spatial Reasoning document, but I, I really had read it from an, an academic point of view. It didn't, it didn't sink in. So after listening to Kathy Bruce speak, I really dove into the Taking Shape book, um, and I was hooked. So I applied for a Teachers Learning Cooperative grant from OTF. Um, and just as an aside, these are um, offered every year, as far as I know. Um, the uh, applications take part. Um, applications are usually due in early fall. And um, it's an incredible opportunity I urge you to consider. But so last year, I applied for the grant, and I was able to work with two full-day kindergarten teams to implement tasks from the book and see the impact on their students. And these kids blew us away. And I'll be sharing more of, of what we saw later in the webinar. But they were doing things, spatial reasoning tasks, that I knew that my students in grade 6 really struggled with. And because of the time I was spending on learning about spatial reasoning, I found myself more and more drawn to examples of spatial reasoning, both in our classrooms and our world. And, and I said before, I didn't like puzzles. Um, I didn't, didn't like visual images and those kind of logic puzzles. But they began to draw me in. And I began to specifically look for those um, on Twitter in particular, which is a huge part of my professional learning community. So that's all to say that I no longer say I'm not good at spatial reasoning because I'm learning. And I'm getting better, and I'm growing those pathways in my brain. Um, and the more I learn, the more I enjoy it. And now these images, these spatial tasks and puzzles, really draw me in. So I want to start with some of the tasks that got me hooked during Kathy's presentation. So we'll take a look here. And there's a link to all of these resources later. Um, so don't worry about it right now. But we're going to go through a few. <coughs> Excuse me. So this image at the top is a piece of paper that's been folded left to right. So the fold is vertical. And there's been a hole punched in the top right corner and the bottom right corner. So think about what that piece of paper will look like when it's unfolded. And as you get that image in your head, put an image, um, a check mark, or any, a star, an icon on the image A, B, or C. OK, I'm seeing a few responses. And everyone put them on C. And yes, yeah, so what I'm interested in is what, how did you know? So what, what did you visualize? 
Did you do any gesturing with your hands? How did you know that C was the answer? And maybe we'll just, uh, for now, just type it in the, the chat box. How did you know that C was the answer? So Chris, I see that you say visualization. Um, we're thinking about it being symmetrical. I imagine it opening the book. Carolyn, did your hands do that? Did you open your hands like a book? And I'm just reading some of the responses here. I knew it was not B because at the top only one far right hole was showing in. It would have been two holes. Okay, so you were you maybe were thinking about it numerically as well, Debbie. The division of dots by two. Carolyn, you didn't you didn't gesture, but uh, Chris, you said yes, like a book, and and you can see there that some of us were thinking about that visually, either imagining it in our head, we were gesturing, and others were thinking about it numerically and counting the number of holes. So that's a really important distinction and that we'll address later. So I want you to think about in the next task um, when you imagine which one, which uh, image is the correct one. Um, are you using numbers to figure it out, or are you using images to figure it out? So here we go. This paper has been folded once horizontally, once vertically, and the dark lines are the folds, and then a hole has been punched in the top right corner. So take a look when you're ready. Again, place a, a star or a smiley face or a check on the one you think. Right, Nick, you're, you were thinking about this one more visually in relationship to the sides, so some proportional reasoning going on there. And, and Mel, you said, I think C because all the holes were lined up. Can you tell me more about that? What, um, what did you mean by lining up? Okay, Debbie, too, you're talking about that proportional reasoning with where the hole is in respect to the, the paper's location, so it was near the ed edge as opposed to farther in. And Stephanie, you, you were thinking about the layers of paper so you knew which one didn't belong and the paper's whole orientation. Okay. So let's try one more of these. So again, this paper is folded in half vertically and then half again horizontally. And you can see the holes that are punched through. Okay. What cues did you attend to for this one? And and I one of the things I'm I'm interested in is that um, where did you only have to pay attention to some of the information, 
or did you factor in all of the information? So Stephanie, I looked at the two dots on the bottom left corner on the folded, okay, and then tried to figure out where they would appear. And Debbie, you um, you were used the word decompose. Do you decompose the B paper into four and fold it in my brain? Yeah. So um, you were understanding that one fourth of each of those open papers would have to match. So that you you've got a couple things going on there: decomposing as well as um, symmetry. And Heidi, you too, you cut B up into quarters. And Chris, you only attended to the single circle in the corners. Yeah, then that's one of the things I attended to first. I first looked for those and then tried to figure out the rest. And C was too uniform. Um, Nick, I like your comment about uh, first thinking that A was not symmetrical. But yes, yeah, so how would A be folded, do you think? That might be a question I would ask a student if they noticed there was symmetry in A. But what would it look like if it was folded and where the holes would be? And Trish, again, you're attending to that. Um, that fourth of it and then repeating four times or the number of dots. So you can see that we're all of us looking at it um, in slightly different ways. Some of us are attending to the number of dots, some of us are attending with decomposing it and only paying attention to the three corners and relating that back to what we knew. Um, and some of us are looking at fourths and symmetries. Um, and so our students approach these tasks in different ways too. So that, that gave you an idea of, of some of the things that really hooked me. And then the, the last one I want to do before we get into it is just something a little bit different. So this um, image shows you that the paper at the top, which is a tall, narrow rectangle is folded in half down. It's then folded in half to the right. Now we have a smaller, narrow uh, rectangle that's again folded down. And then the corner is snipped off. So again, I'd like you to visualize what that paper would look like when it's unfolded. And then this has put a question mark, but put any symbol on the image you think it will be. And what I, um, one of the questions I want you to think about is um, how sure, how confident are you? in your answer. So not as much agreement here. So let's let's talk this out. I see A, B, and D. So we're we seem to be all dismissing C. So Carolyn, 
You're pretty confident in B because you cheated and tried it. Um, let, yeah, I don't think you cheated. I think you explored. So you actually took a piece of paper and folded it. Nick, you're about 90% sure. Mel, you, Melanie, you're saying that the based on the number of times folded, you think there will be two diamonds. So that's an interesting concept to think about. How many layers of paper are in that small rectangle by the end? It's folded once. It's folded twice. It's folded a third time. Does anyone want to change their mind? So Nick, you're thinking you're mentally unfolding it. Yeah, I, I, I tend to look at it that way too. So I'm going to leave that with you. I'm actually not going to tell you what the answer is. Um, during the, the webinar, if you um, want to take some paper and try it out, um, try it out later. But I, I want to leave that with you to, to percolate a bit. Um, because these are the types of problems that um, kids will come back to and try them again and again. Um, and I like the idea of showing students that, you know, we can make a conjecture. We can think we're, say, 90% confident, but then maybe as we think more, we're not just going to let the math pass go. We're going to think about it, and we're going to come back, and we're going to try it again, and we're going to review and revise our math thinking just like we do, we review and revise lots of our other thinking in our other um, subjects. So I'll leave that with you for now. All right. So uh, spatial reasoning involves uh, that understanding of those relationships um, between structures and through a wide variety of different representations. So they might be drawings, they might be computer models, and it also involves the means to communicate about them and helping students develop that real specificity of language to be able to explain their thinking. So when a child rotates a shape to fit in a puzzle, she's employing spatial reasoning. Um, when a student uses a diagram of a rectangle to prove that the formula for finding the area of a triangle is length times height divided by two, they're using special, spatial reasoning. And it spatial reasoning affects our ability to solve all sorts of problems, investigate all sorts of problems, and all through different strands in math. So not just in geometry, but in patterning and algebra, in measurement, in number sets. And that's what we're going to explore tonight. So this is the spatial reasoning uh, document. Um, it was published a number of years ago. I don't have the exact uh, date. There is a link to it, like I said, at the end. Um, but also, if you just Google paying attention to spatial reasoning, you'll get lots of resources. Um, and I really recommend that you uh, download it. You take some time to read it and make connections to you and your uh, students. Um, so before we get into it, what do you think spatial reasoning includes? Both in school and out, in your own lives, in the lives of your students, what does spatial reasoning mean to you?
and we can, um, we're pretty small, well, I don't know, we're a little bit bigger now. So let's just answer in the chat pod, I think. So take a minute, take a few seconds, think about it. What does spatial reasoning mean to you, and where do you think it lives in school and in your lives and in the lives of our students? Um, and you'll be able to read the chat pod, but I'll just, as you're thinking, read them out too. So we, we're we thinking about being able to visualize, the ability to ma manipulate objects in space visually, um, understanding how things fit together and relate to each other, the space around us, um, that ability to figure out your, your where you are in relation to your world, that's almost that that uh, personal space. <laughs> nice, when you, I, I don't know if uh, spatial reasoning is reorganizing your pantry to avoid report cards or whether that's just um, procrastination, perhaps. <laughs> Chris, using it everywhere and in many situations, um, is there a specific example you can think of? And Debbie, you're um, talking about visually breaking things apart and putting them back together. And manipulating objects, Tris, and, and how it fits into a new space. So I think about uh, how you might be packing uh, uh, a car trunk or a suitcase or um, a bag or something like that, and how you can get it all in one space. Sandra, yes, directionality. We haven't really talked about that yet. Oh, thank you, Mally. You've put the, the doc link in there. That's great. Hi, Sherry. Welcome. Oh, Chris, you have back in your car into the parking space. Packing our bags for school. Um, the teachers, I think, are really good at that. Moving objects. OK. So um, we're going to talk about all of those things and some others that you might not have considered were part of spatial reasoning. And um, in the doc, there is this nice um, visual image. And I, I don't expect you to be able to read what's on the, the slide deck right now. I've highlighted a few of them that we're going to talk about. Uh, so this little section, these are some of the ones that I think go together. Um, so navigating and wayfinding, moving your body in space, uh, orienting and locating objects and remembering the location of objects. So uh, uh, examples that would fit with that, we've had some. Crystal, absolutely connecting to dance and sports. So you can see how spatial reasoning applies to a number of different subjects, not just math. Right, that athletic ability. Um, hockey, football, soccer, mapping. Yep. Where you put your glasses and keys, yeah. I also think it's about um, that a, a personal space. So we all know people who seem to move effortlessly through rooms and others of us who maybe um, cut corners when we're turning, we're bumping into walls, um, we're maybe getting too close to people and objects, we knock things off counters. And Nick definitely using a lot of the new um, robotics that are available in our schools with learning to code, and that's definitely one of the activities we're going to be talking about. So some of the examples that I thought about is absolutely is remembering where I parked. Oh, a corn maze, that's a good one. 
parked. I guess my own. Did I miss an example? No, just remembering where I parked. I guess this is mine. So another little subset is that um, ability to visualize perspective and proportional reasoning. So scaling up and down. So visualizing things as they shrink and grow. Seeing things from different views, top, bottom, left, right. Um, imagining a path. So if you're a golfer. And how can you hit that ball so it goes a certain direction? Or how can you throw that baseball? Or how can you throw that snowball, which we know never happens? Okay. Some of the examples I thought about here, um, in terms of, of math, are these type of activities. So thinking about which of these nets fold to make an open top box. And how do you visualize and what strategies do you use? And this is a really common task that we use with students, especially in, in the junior grades, but beginning as early as primary. Uh, Debbie, you're mentioning tiling a plane. Yes, so that tessellation. Um, symmetry, um, uh, Chris, canoeing amongst islands, so following a map and, and keeping a, a kind of a picture in your head of where you are from an overview. Okay. So uh, another one I thought is, is some of these, uh, this artwork, this chalk art. And these, this is the type of images that have really started to appeal to me as I've spent more time exploring spatial reasoning. Um, before, I'd look at this and go, oh, that's cool, but I had no idea how they would do it. So I think about spatial reasoning and art and our artistic kids and, and providing them with these opportunities to create and learn about how to create perspective in their drawings. And my nemesis, not only I'm pretty good now backing a car into a spot, but I'm still really experiencing a growth mindset when it comes to backing up my trailer. And um, I'm, I'm not giving up, though. And we all know people who can do that effortlessly um, because they've, they've worked at it and they, they, they see it. So that orient, orienting yourself in space and visualizing and building an object from different views. And Brain Builders is a great game, um, easily available from different stores, Amazon included, not too expensive. And what it does is it gives this card here uh, with the top side and front view, and then uh, it has the little blocks to build, the little rectangles to build, and then they can check to see if they did it right on the other side. So that's a nice little um, game you can build uh, into your classroom. Or you can create your own cards with um, different manipulatives that you use already. So some of your wooden blocks or your 3D figures um, or your square tiles or pattern blocks. And having kids create those views. All right, another little highlighted section. Um, and this is where that decomposing and composing comes in. Drawing, creating, designing. So reading a map, how do you navigate? Um, do you use GPS? Do you turn your map? Um, do you use GPS that turns your map for you? Do you think in terms of turning left or right or north or south? Um, do you think you have a sense of direction? And there's some interesting research coming out right now that says that um, the more we use GPS, the less we're able to hold those images in our hands. Okay. Um, and this is a really common task. So 
using any combination of the pattern blocks above and your visualization skills. What are the fewest number of blocks needed to fill the figure at the right? What is the greatest number of blocks? And we'll be doing some activities later with some uh, virtual uh, pattern blocks. Yes, Debbie, we're going to be actually talking about some symmetry stuff later. So um, I'd love to see your link, and I have some things to share. And then um, we are, the idea of being able to compose and decompose IKEA furniture. Um, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't work so well, um, and sometimes it doesn't work when we are maybe working, trying to assemble something with a partner, and um, maybe it, that isn't such a good idea. And the last little bit, and this is an area I'm still really um, exploring, but the idea of using proportional reasoning and nonverbal reasoning. And there's a little cartoon here, and it's a little small. Um, so um, I love Foxtrot. Why do you? Why do they make us study math in school? I hate it. Not now, Paige. I'm trying to think. It's not like I'm planning to go into astrophysics or something. I need to cut this quiche into five equal pieces. Give me one example where I'm ever going to use this junk I'm learning in geometry class. Just one. Let's see. A fifth of a circle is just cut it into 72 degree wedges and listen to me, mother. Thanks. Okay, fine. Give me two examples. Wait. Peter wanted his slice twice as big as the others. So we need to make, we hear that from our kids all the time. Where am I going to use this? Um, and we know that there's a disconnect between school math, what kids consider school math, and the math they do in their own lives that they really don't understand is math. So we want to help to bridge that gap and, and say, yes, there's a purpose to what we're learning. We're learning to solve problems. We're learning to um, you develop skills that we can use later. So, um, why is spatial reasoning so important? These five points come from the Taking Shape book. They also are in the Paying Attention to document. It's an overview of uh, the research. And we're just going to go through um, each of those briefly. So spatial reasoning and mathematical thinking are intimately linked. So there's so much research now, apparently, and some of it's in the book, some I've read, that two of the researchers quoted state that the relationship between spatial ability and mathematics is so well established that it no longer makes sense to ask whether they are related. So essentially it's saying, look, we're done. We've proven this. Let's not waste time finding out if it is important. Let's just say, yes, they are, and move on that spatial reasoning can be improved and that education matters. So just like there's no such thing like a math brain, spatial ability is not a biologically determined trait. Some of us might come hardwired with some of these pathways and it might come more easily to us, but we can all learn and grow and develop these abilities. And I've proven that over the last couple of years. And I really think this is the beginnings of growth mindsets developing in children. And we know how important that is uh, for math success. All right. Um, the research is showing that spatial thinking is an important predictor of achievement in STEM careers. Because, and it's not only in geometry and other mathematics, but as we've mentioned, it's in science, technology, coding, and robotics engineering and architecture, and art, music, and dance, all of those things. So as we help students develop these abilities, we're keeping the doors open. We're keeping those options open to them. And so having classrooms full of materials that can support spatial reasoning 
And having them available to all of our students is really uh, crucial. Our fourth point, spatial reasoning is currently an underserved area of mathematics instruction. Um, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics recommends that 50% of mathematics instructional time focus on spatial reasoning. What do you think about that? That, that blew me away. I think about what that looks like in so, um, how I could do that with so much else I have to cover in the math curriculum. Where does spatial reasoning live in my classroom? Um, I, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm really, that's, a, that's something I'm puzzling about. I don't know what that means. Um, it certainly, I know it can't mean I'm going to devote 50% of my time to the geometry strand, but what could it mean? Where does spatial reasoning live in my classroom? What other subjects is it in? Um, when I am teaching geometry and we're exploring um, geometry, have I gone beyond the basic naming and listing characteristics? Um, do I want, do I go beyond what are the attributes of 2D shapes? What are the characteristics of 3D objects? So am I focusing on what's important about spatial reasoning as opposed to just the knowledge and skills level? So that, that gave me pause to think about and examine my practice. And I, I'm not sure yet, there yet. Um, but the other piece that I really um, resonates with me is that spatial reasoning provides multiple entry points and equitable access to mathematics. And we know those kids. We know kids who struggle. Excuse me, just adjusting myself here. We know kids that struggle uh, with some of the number tasks we provide, but then excel at the spatial reasoning tasks, at the movement and location, at the creation. That's an interesting question, Sandra. We know that the uh, curriculum is being reviewed right now. And um, I know that many of the researchers that worked with Kathy Bruce and Ruth Beattie um, are, um, you know, connected strongly to our Ministry of Education. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they uh, revamp that curriculum. Um, um, another math educator and researcher, Ruth Beattie, who, um, if uh, you haven't heard of her, please take time to get to know her work. Um, she's a, a brilliant researcher and, and very passionate about math um, and Indigenous education right now. And one of the things, uh, I had the opportunity to work with her quite closely last year, and, and one of the things she tells us is that about 50% of our learners will think about mathematicals in a, mathematics in a numerical way, and 50% will think about mathematics visually. And as I've thought about that and I've looked for that, I, I see that in the students and I see it in the adults. I tend to view the world in a numerical way. So if I'm looking at patterns, I'm counting the, number, the numbers. Other people look at patterns and see the positive space, the negative space, um, and they really do interpret them visually. So again, something to be uh, aware of. So that's the, the research. And then what's involved in spatial reasoning is visualization that we've talked about, mental rotation, moving those objects in space, um, moving our bodies in space like phys ed, um, being able to hold visual spatial information in our memory and work with it. Um, processing it. How do we look at an image and interpret it? Knowing the language really improves our ability. So certainly in early primary, uh, those of you who are in FDK in grade one and grade two and grade three, um, we know that we're pushing kids to be more specific in their language and not use those general terms, but um, become 
more clear by saying, um, you know, it stood upright, or we put it close to, or beside, or on, or under, or all those other things. So visualization passed like this. About how many paper clips will it take to measure the length of the blue line? About how many square tiles will it take? So again, that's a composing and decomposing. It's how we visualize. And spatial vis visualization is, is that ability to perceive complex spatial patterns and comprehend imaginary moments in space. So if you take a look at these images, you can really see, like these are really common tasks in our curriculum, but they help students incorporate visualization rather than just giving them pencil and paper tasks to do it. Um, let's see, another task we can do is uh, to ask students to build in their mind, and I'm going to go back here for a minute, we're going to ask students to build something in their mind and then compare their image with one you were describing. So, for example, I want you to close your eyes, I want you to look off in the distance and listen to what I'm saying. So, imagine that you have three red cubes, three yellow cubes, and one blue cube. Take all three red cubes and make a tower. Take all three yellow cubes and make a tower. Take the red tower and stand it up straight. Now take the yellow tower Turn it on its side and attach it on top of the red tower. So you should have a shape that looks like a capital T. Now take the one blue cube and attach it on the top of the middle yellow cube. And now take that shape and flip it upside down. Does everyone have that image in your brain? So let's take a look. Which image did you see? What challenges did you face? Or, and if, if not you, what challenges do you think your students would face? And what might help them with those challenges? What would be challenging about this task? Right? So our English language learners might struggle with the language, definitely. So uh, thinking about that, what could you do to support them? Okay. Having difficulty visualizing. And so it's um, knowing your students who um, have challenges visualizing um, building these tasks in, finding those moments with them to work with each other and develop that. Nick, yes, I wondered about the um, whether people would attach it in the middle and whether they had it someplace else and then had to adjust when I said it looked like a capital T. So, S Stephanie, you have all of your, your students are um, English language learners. 
Um, and so you obviously wouldn't be giving this many instructions at once, correct? Or um, could these instructions be given in their own language, in their, their language of or origin, so that they could practice the visualization? Um, and Chris, definitely holding all that information in your head at once, right? And if you zone out for a minute, did you miss a direction? And Debbie, yeah, you mentioned that you forgot that slip at the end. So you were all set to go. Okay. And Crystal, that, that's a great um, modification to this activity where you give a direction and then visualize it. OK, now build that part. OK, here comes the next part. Visualize, now build that stuff. Yes, definitely slowing down. Chunking the directions, sharing at certain points. Yeah. So you can see how this is a task. I mean, this was a four or five step task. You could certainly start with one step, right? Visualize a, a three cube standing, three red cubes standing upright. OK, what does your design look like? And then have them build it. And having exactly, so to remove those visual distractors, the extra cubes only give them what's there. All right. So another, another task is that ability to rotate in our mind, that mental rotation. Um, and this is something that's really challenging for people to, again, hold the image in your mind and flip it around. And Debbie, yes, you make a really good point about not removing all of the struggle. We want to um, keep these tasks so there's a challenge. We want to um, keep the, the cognitive demand. Otherwise, we're just practicing things we already know. Right? So we want to find that, that zone of optimum productive struggle where kids are being challenged to push boundaries and learn new things, and then, but not um, have them so far out of their reach that they become frustrated. Right? And Sandy, absolutely, you need to, to modify these uh, tasks for what your kids need. So following as you did and pairing it with manipulatives. But at some point, having them stop and visualize before they build. So that's how we, if we just have them build, we're not building in the, um, the visualization process. So mental rotation, visual speaking, spatial working memory, like just we just talked about being able to hold all that information. Um, and we, we see that in our classrooms when we quickly show an image, like dots, and ask them how many they saw. Or quickly show a drawing and then ask them to copy it. Or quickly show an image of pattern blocks and ask them to build it. So again, they've seen a visual image. They're trying to hold it in their memory, and they're trying to manipulate it and uh, do a task with it. So this is what we want to try. So there is a, a website um, that you can type in, www.mathies.ca. And I know Mally will pop that into the chat box in a minute. And what I'd like you to do is go to that website. And when you get there, you'll see at the top, it'll say games. And the next section will say learning tools. I want you to click on learning tools. And in there, as you scroll down, you'll see a color tiles application. And one of the um, options on the right-hand side will say open. Now, those of you who are on a tablet, I haven't tested this out. So I'm hoping it works for you. 
So you're going to go to mathies.ca. You're going to open the learning tools. You're going to open the color tiles application. And when we're ready, what I'm going to do is flash an image on the next slide for a few seconds. Then I want you to hold it in your mind and go to the app to build it. So when you are have the color tiles application open, could you please put a smiley face beside your name? So I know that everyone's got that open, ready to go. Okay, I'm seeing a couple smiley faces. Nick, I'm glad to see that you uh, are using the Massey's apps. There's lots of great ones in there. And if any of you are having trouble opening the Massey's app, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of smiley faces, so I, I don't want to rush anyone, but if you could let me know. Oh, I see the smiles disappear. Okay. Okay, so Jillian, you can you will still be able to participate in this task, just not as um, easily. It's really interesting trying to do spatial reasoning on a webinar where everything is uh, digital <laughs> and we don't have manipulatives in front of us. So uh, I've uh, had to improvise and, and try to come up with some solutions. All right, so I think we're ready to go. I'm going to show you an image, and I'm going to hold it for five seconds. I want you to hold it in your mind, and then go to the app to build it. And those of you who are on a MacBook, I apologize. Um, if you happen to have a piece of paper and a pen nearby, um, maybe you could quickly sketch what you're about to see. All right. Okay. Take a few seconds, build that with the square tiles. Put a check mark on the PowerPoint screen here. So Debbie, that's one of my questions. What happened? How sure are you about your creation? And did you do any thinking aloud or talking? So you were repeating the, the colors and trying to get a visual. Um, and Nick, you're not as sure as you thought you'd be. So you thought, oh, easy peasy, I'm, I'm going to go. And then all of a sudden you're having second thoughts. <laughs> Speaking colors orally, yes, Sherry, oh boy, um, I feel your pain. Oh, and, and focus, so oh, there's a lot of in, image there, that colors and the blank spaces. Okay, so let's go back. I'll show you. What do you think?
And again, doing this task with your students, um, you can start small. You can start with two squares. You don't have to build an elaborate design. You can help kids work up to it. Um, you can have the tools in front of them. Um, this is a great barrier game for kids to play. Um, these are cards are easy to make up on the Massey's tool. Um, I know printing in color is, is often a, a problem. Um, making them with square tiles and then taking pictures of them. So uh, quick task, that ability to um, hold information in your brain. Uh, yes, Debbie, my snipping tool. I love snippets. That's exactly how I did it for the PowerPoint. And as we're doing the, these tasks with visual spatial working memory, our brains process information in a couple of different ways. And we, um, we think sequentially, so when we're following directions. And I, I heard that when people were talking about, well, I counted the colors, and I put them in order, and I saw it. But then we also can think simultaneously in those chunks. So if I'd given you an image like this, of a chair that looks somewhat like a chair, would it have been easier to remember? Because you can make a connection to it. You, um, you slide that image into a pathway you've already made. Oh, Nick, I love that idea of as kids get better at the challenges, then ask them to build them upside down. That's a great idea. So you can see how these build from K to 3. And then what we need to do is teach kids our, the spatial language. So certainly they come in with lots of prior knowledge about spatial reasoning, lots of language. But the more language we can give them, the better they will be able to um, describe it to themselves and then be able to follow those directions more easily. Right? So Debbie, in terms of what kinds would be appropriate for kindergarten, I would be starting with two square tiles in different positions. And do they remember that the red is beside the blue, or that the green is on top of the yellow, or that the, the green is there and then there's a space, and then, and then adding um, more um, visual criteria. Um, another example is a, a barrier game, and I'm, I'm kind of uh, um, cognizant of my timing here. Uh, so I'm going to show, just explain, rather than get back into the Mathies. We will come back to Mathies in a minute. But one of the other tools on Mathies is a um, pattern block app, so there's the square tiles, there's also the pattern blocks, and I would give directions, and you're probably all familiar with these barrier tasks, where I would give directions and have you build, but you, um, and I would describe this image and then we would compare. So this is a great game that kids love to play with each other. And it has two-fold benefits. So it has benefits for the speaker of having to use that mathematical language and be specific and clear. And it has benefits for the player with being able to attend to information, rotate images in their head, hold information, think sequentially and simultaneously, and build the image. Okay. And then um, one of the final aspects is um, gestures. And this is something that I'm really interested in. There's just some new uh, research on the impact of gesturing on both on the part of the teacher and the student. Um, and it's really intriguing me at the moment. Um, it's something that is really hard to get at in this format since we can't see each other. But uh, one of the examples is uh, this task, which is a numerical task, 
And we might not think about it as a spatial reasoning task. But if we were to gesture when we ask a student to say, 5 plus 3 plus 4 equals something plus 4, you can imagine that if I'm holding up five fingers and three fingers apart, and then I'm moving them together and gesturing that I'm combining them, how that might help the visual thinkers and visual learners in our classroom with seeing those numbers come together. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on gestures tonight, but it's something I really want you to keep in mind and watch for. And as uh, I think as, as you're more aware of it, you'll see kids gesturing in a lot of different aspects, and it'll be really interesting. All right. So where does spatial reasoning live? We've talked about some of these. Symmetry, composing and decomposing 2D shapes, composing and decomposing 3D shapes, 3D objects, locating, orienting, mapping, and coding, and perspective taking. So these are the activities we did in the research project. These are the lessons that are in the Taking Shape book. And if you can get your hands on one, um, I would really recommend it. Nick, yes, the relational rod app from Mathies, or if you have physical Cuisinaire rods, Cuisinaire rods, those relational rods are an amazing tool for spatial reasoning and um, proportional reasoning. And I think they're highly underused in our classrooms. So symmetry. These are some of the tasks we did. It's one of the first activities we get, did um, in the late fall. So with uh, both year one and year two full day kindergarten students, you can see some examples there. Um, they were creating uh, symmetrical patterns using magnetic pattern blocks. They painted their names on paper and then folded. They, uh, using the materials outside, so uh, certainly for those of you who are um, FDK educators, you know that you're spending a great deal of your time outside and the learning goes on and we bring in the math outside. So they had some uh, fabulous fun doing the symmetrical activities um, in, the, in the snow. And then that, the top right picture is a pentomino symmetry game where uh, one student had a, a pen, placed a pentomino and the other student tried to repeat it, reflect it on the other side. Um, we did tasks where we folded a piece of paper and cut out a shape and then asked students to predict what the shape would look like. We did the whole punch symmetry challenge that we started with at the beginning. We played symmetry games, like I like the picture with the pentominoes, but we also used pattern blocks, square tiles, um, anything. We had a, a number of um, surfaces with tape on them around the classroom, uh, and it, they were just available all the time for kids to take the manipulators out and play those symmetry games together. Um, with the hole punch game, this was something we did and, and we sent home. And the kids uh, thought it was hysterical when they could fool their parents. And again, we created a number of image cards by taking pictures of half designs and then put them in a center so that students could just create and explore uh, symmetry. They could use mirrors to check. Um, and what happened is that students began to see symmetry everywhere in their world. And they would point it out in their environment, in architecture, in art. Um, one of our favorite discoveries, uh, kids came in uh, with uh, images from a website by a man named Adam Hillman, and he creates these images from 
simple objects. He's got ones with paper clips and gummy bears and birthday candles, uh, very accessible. Um, and we had so much fun exploring these and then creating our own in our class. And doing this in a, a grade two class was amazing. So um, if you look up Adam Hillman Art, you'll find his work. And um, it's all for sale. Um, he has a wonderful, um, I'm beginning to lose my thinking too, uh, Instagram. Uh, thank you. He has a wonderful Instagram. You can follow him there and, and see his work. Um, but it was just uh, using um, his images to inspire kids to create their own. All right. Um, composing 2D, and, uh, 2D shapes. One of our, our favorite ones was a story where we, we told different versions of a magic key story. Um, and I did this in classrooms from um, FDK to grade four. And uh, different versions uh, that ended with, we had to create 12 different keys. Each key is made up of five squares. And the squares had to line up on one full side. And all the keys must be different. And can you build all 12 keys using the square tiles? So, so um, those of you who are familiar with pentominoes realize that when you create 12 different objects uh, with five square tiles each, you get the 12 pentominoes. And um, what was amazing was that the students really explored the idea of congruence and depending on the age um, and developmental level, this was really challenging because when they had to determine when orientation mattered and when it did not. So a dog is a dog is a dog no matter which way it's facing. But in letters, a B is not a D, and that's not a P, and that's not a Q. So this task was really uh, interesting for them to explore. And so we had them create them with the square tiles, and then we had them color them in on grid chart paper, and we compared. And all of the students in FDK, when we did this, we spent several weeks coming back to it. They discovered all 12. And the, the excitement and pride and um, fun that they had doing it was amazing. Um, and, but it was still a challenging task for the grade fours that we did it with. So again, you could do it um, virtually on uh, massies.ca. Um, but when I'm talking about spatial reasoning with kids, I really want them to be handling them um, and physically manipulating them. So definitely Blockus is one of my favorite games. Um, it really reminds me of the virtual game Tetris. And Nick, yes, Rush Hour, um, Rush Hour is a game that we've had in our home. Now my daughter is uh, turning 26 next month. Um, and it was her favorite game. My daughter is uh, definitely a spatial thinker and has uh, enjoys it and has honed her skills that way. And we would travel for hours in the car and she and her friend had the rush hour game and just played it over and over and over again. We had a similar one that had tangrams. Okay. So some of the other decomposing and composing 2D shapes are um, covering, how many ways can you cover a hexagon, creating line designs and having students fill them in. And that uh, image there, I'm not sure what it is, candlestick, rockets, something. Um, if you Google uh, Tangram or, or um, pattern block templates, again, there's lots available free on the internet. And then, um, the shape transformer was one of our favorites where we would put a card like the two triangles in and then the students had to predict what shape would come out. Okay. 
One of the things that's really exciting for me is uh, with composing and compo decomposing 2D and 3D is that the research is really clear that not only does it help students uh, with their spatial reasoning, but it helps them with their number sense because the ability to break apart shapes and put them back together in unique ways is exactly what we're doing when we're de decomposing and composing numbers in order to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, it's really important for fractional work. It's really important for work with decimals. So this is a skill in primary if you can really lay those foundations and build those, um, that conceptual de development, it will really benefit your learners in the long run. So simple games you can have in the classroom is sets of pentominoes and sets of tangrams. Uh, they are available quite inexpensively, plus they're available usually with templates, so you can print them out on cardstock and laminate them. And just leave those challenges up. How many different rectangles can you make with pentominoes? How many different squares can you make? When we're talking about 3D shapes, um, it's, it adds in that, um, obviously, third dimension of uh, moving into space. And it really takes it up to the next level. And one of my favorite, favorite activities to do, actually mostly with adults in PD sessions, um, is this one. And uh, we start in kindergarten with how many different objects can you make with three linking cubes? And then how many can you make with four? And you can see the eight images there of how many unique ways you can combine three linking cubes, uh, four linking cubes. And then the challenge I give uh, my adult students in uh, math workshops and in summer academy um, and in uh, staff meetings, all, all places, is how many unique objects can be created with five linking cubes. So if you can make eight with four, how many do you think you can make with five? And if you could type that into the chat box, that would be great. I see a 10. Carolyn, I see a 35, 42, 24. And I would certainly ask students what they're basing these predictions on and uh, what criteria they're using. Are they um, reasonable predictions? Debbie's thinking more and now revising her number more than 10. So um, no, I'll wait a little bit more. So one of the reasons I love to do this with adults during PD sessions is that um, it's a challenge. There are actually 35 unique combinations. And in the past six months when I've done this at probably now nine different uh, workshops, we've yet to get 35 unique shapes. And so we've left them up. Um, when I taught Summer Academy and we had three days to do them, we left them up. Yeah, Debbie, want, uh, Car Carolyn, Debbie wants to know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was waiting for Trish to say something because Trish might also have been at a PD in the summer, but um, OK. Okay, so another um, task, and and I want to, we can't do this virtually. Um, we don't have a Massey's tool that has cubes. We can't. It's <coughs> excuse me. We can't simulate that. But I want you to imagine that you have three red cubes. So again, close your eyes, look off to the side. <coughs> excuse me. 
take the three red cubes and snap them together to make a tower. Imagine the tower standing up like a building. Now, imagine you have one blue cube and snap it on top of the red tower. So you should now have a red tower with a blue cube on top of it. Did everyone have B? So again, another visualization tool. You can see how you can modify it for your students, how you can play with that. There are so many tasks you can do to support composing and decomposing two and 3D shapes and objects. And as I said, it's so important to build those abilities um, and spatial reasoning because they transfer to students' abilities to do them with number. Um, you can give uh, students a list of criteria that's more open-ended. So you must have four blue cubes on the bottom, you must have three green cubes on the second, and you must have two cubes, red cubes on the third. How many different buildings can you make that follow these rules? So again, a task that lends itself to extended exploration. You can come back to it, you can revise it, and you can build in opportunities for that productive struggle. Um, and our final section is around location and movement, which many of us are familiar with. Um, we can build maps like this and talk about uh, how to get from one point to another. Um, one grade three class I worked in, we created a map like this um, a few years ago, uh, but we used the Paralympic sports symbols, and students mapped out how they would get from one venue to another. And we then paired this with both money and time, and so that every time they moved a block, we said it took 15 minutes and cost 35 cents. So if you started at 3 o'clock, how long would it take you to get from A to B and how much money it would it cost you? When we're looking at the math curriculum, there's so much that we want our students to learn. There's so much material. We need to uh, think of all the different ways we can combine. So this um, orienteering, orientation and mapping problem Building in money, building in elapsed time combines a number of those expectations. Debbie, yes, I'm going to uh, type in the chat box. Um, Steve Wyborny is someone I put on the resource list, I believe. Well, Steve Wyborny.com. And he, his, Resources are absolutely incredible, and he is so generous. He's created all of these resources for free. You can download them. Um, it is worth your time to take the time to explore. So we have paper tasks like this. We also have physical tasks. So we're moving on a hundredth carpet. We're, we're moving in the gym. We're moving outside. We're coding in gym class, where we're giving them directions. We're coding with robotics. Or we're designing patterns um, on a grid, right? Um, playing pentomino battleships, so the typical battleship game, which is something you might know, um, but might be too challenging for primary, you can change it where we, you place two pentominoes on your grid and the other player calls out letter number coordinates. If it's a hit, they put one color of a square tile. 
If they if it's a miss, they put a different, and player two determines whether they're creating a pentomino or not, or not. Um, and finally, uh, perspective taking. Again, it's that ability to move your body in space and imagine. So we did tasks like a mother bird was flying home and flew over a building that looked like this. What could the building look like? Build all the different shapes using linking cubes. Then we moved to something more abstract where we showed drawings. What, where would someone be if they saw this building from each view? And you can see how you can easily do this, um, you know, in an FDK class where kids are building uh, with the blocks. And you ask them, what would you, what would you draw if you looked down on your tower? What would you draw if you were laying on the floor looking at it from the front? So giving those prompts and providing those op opportunity. Again using square tiles or coloring on the grid paper to show what would this shape look like from the top or from the front or the bottom or each side. These are crucial concepts that are really challenging for students in grade six. And so I, I think about what, how powerful it would be if kids have the opportunity to play with these ideas and experiment in the earlier grades and really build those spatial reasoning pathways in their brains. All right. So we are in under just the wire at 5 to 9. You guys have been amazing uh, hanging in there on a Thursday night. Um, like I said, the last three slides um, are all resources. So if you have the um, the Google slides, the Bitly, you will have these right away. If not, I know they'll be up very shortly in a few days on um, OTC. Um, Debbie, the the Splat series um, using them in kindergarten in grade one but he has splats that go up into uh, algebraic concepts and fractions. So they are usable from K to 8. They're quite amazing. So thank you very much. Um, the resources here are on the last three slides. Um, everything I've talked about is here. And um, go out and play and explore. And as I said, please feel free to contact me and ask any questions. Um, check me out on Twitter. I'd love to have a conversation. And have a great night. And I hope your report card writing goes quickly and smoothly. Thanks so much, Kit. That was great. Um,